is about all kinds of local products and also we try to get um, people that are surrounding um, the land here in Umiya to get together on the table with people that are interested in culture and everything. Um, how did it start? It started in the Build Museum with Cecilia Anderson. She's sitting there. Can you do your hands, Cecilia? Most people might know it. Cecilia knew about a project My Pictures, the artist group I'm one from is, was doing a project in Berlin and that was about the food in and out and in and around Berlin that was eaten during a festival. Um, she invited me to the Bild Museum and then we did a workshop and in that workshop we found out because if you talk about preconceptions uh, I thought, I go so far north, nothing will grow here, you know, it's too cold. And then we had this uh, workshop, and then people were sitting at the table, said, this is growing here, this is growing here, this is growing here. So for me, it was an eye-opener that I have no idea what's going on here. So I got curious. Of course, I know the reindeer stories, but I didn't know the stories about uh, that you also have Delta and you have old collection soil here, so it was quite surprised. So I got also curious to do it and then we found this survival kit festival and this culture city um, thing and then we thought we have to do it. The rest is um, actually thanks to Build Museum and Su Chi Li was walking there. See for May and Cecilia went around and were meeting all the farmers and also people we have here on and around the table. Um, I think it's important that it's not only on a, a market where you meet or on a field where you meet, but you also meet at the table, like today, and that we also have um, yeah, conversations, and I try to read it, but if you think she forgets something, please tell me. Also, if you think, uh, oh, this is because I have hearing aids, sometimes I do not hear well, and sometimes I do not listen well, and sometimes I do not understand the words you're saying, not because my English is too bad, but because it's just a too specific word. That also might happen to you, because we are here multidisciplinary, and if you have a word that you think, okay, do not understand, just raise your hand and ask, you know. No question is stupid in this context because we are all specialists in another corner. And uh, if you are together, some, sometimes you, you lost your interest then and then you, because you, you missed the word. Um, I want to explain to you uh, a bit about um, who's here today and also um, a bit about what's the Scafri about. Let's start with the Scafri. The Scafri is about gift economy. What we have in the Scafri is given by uh, people. So today, for example, uh, later on, uh, Suchi will explain who gave the potatoes and where they're from, etc., etc. But it's also what is given, literally. What's there is there. And in EMEA, it's also that you have a lot of migrants there. So you also have, uh, of course, stuff that comes in and goes out. So Cecilia brought stuff from Italy, I brought some snaps from Holland, and Suchi had wonderful stuff over her mother. That's also part of local culture. Um, and then you have, of course, all the things that grow here, and this evening will be very much about 
the growing here and what is what uh, what is going on here in this this uh, area with growers and also with rural culture. Um, then, of course, you have. Um, I have to now. I hope I say your names good, you know, but otherwise you just correct me, I hope. Um, we have uh, different people at the table. We also, oh, he now stands up, but that's Pavlos Georgiadis. How does, I think you, yeah. He is uh, an important person in the whole food business and also he will explain later what he's doing. He is, um, Somebody that's important in the whole movement in Greece uh, and of the young farmers, of the slow food um, movement and more important, he's also a farmer himself. I found out yesterday he makes good olive oil. Today he is, was in charge of the lamb. I couldn't touch the lamb anymore because there was really an idea about how the lamb should be and it will be delicious, I uh, think so. And. Um, we also have, uh, with Pavlos, there was uh, already a program last week. He is uh, in the taste of transparency, he did a program. Some of you might met him there. Uh, but he will explain later the how and what of it. He is from the scientific background, but now is into activism and farming. Um, then we have um, Arne Lindström. He's sitting here. I'm, uh, that's, that you know who is who. I was this morning looking at what he's doing and I found all this kind of interesting Swedish information that I couldn't find out what it is. Um, but it's from the farmers organization now and he will tell you, uh, he's here with um, Mats Granat, that's sitting there. So, and later on we also can spread the people a bit around the table, so you also have table conversations. Then we have uh, from Norten, that's Morten Rasmussen, he's sitting here, he will, yeah, he will explain later to you something about why they uh, have a seed bank, how it works, and also uh, why that matters for food, because that's our team why food matters and of course without seed you have no vegetables, that's a thing. Then we have a presentation by Jan from Fenberg, she's sitting there, yeah. Uh, and um, I saw very nice cows on the website but also the text was um, in Swedish and I'm very curious uh, about her dairy farm and about what she will tell us later on. Um, who is um, Wu. I will also, I think afterwards you also can introduce each other in front of the table. Um, and we also have, of course, Susan Yort. She's sitting there. And Susan Yort, I met before uh, about two weeks ago, so we do not know each other very well, but I got two books of her. Um, and in the airport and in the airplane I was reading again. She knows a lot about rural uh, migration, city to uh, rural and the other way around. And it was quite interesting for me to read something about Sweden. I also had a touristic book about this area and that was the things that I know about it. Because I couldn't go around to the farms, it was Suchi that went to the farms and Cecilia, so I have uh, only of the food heard about the surrounding landscape till now. I think for our introduction this was it, and um, maybe you uh, have already some questions about how the evening will run, or are you all informed that we uh, will sit together and uh, yeah, if somebody has a question you can do it now, but uh, I think it will also follow up. Um, the people there, uh, you can, uh, I would say, take a seat at the table. You're so far away now. <laughs> so, yeah, there are also places there, yeah. The first speech is by Pavlos. 
Gael Giadis, but I first want to know how you say your name correct. Depends on the country. Depends on the country, okay. You have very multicultural names. Okay. Can you take the mic? Uh, yeah? Yeah, I stand here. No, better you stand here because, uh, or, or you can also, what, what you want. You can also sit at the table. Um, I'll sit at the table with you a little bit later. I'm yeah. sorry that I was not here to welcome you, but somehow I got uh, to in grips, into grips with a humongous task of cooking water for like 40 people today, and it was something I've never done before, so I'm um, a little bit overwhelmed. But uh, the whole idea of tonight's event would be to have an informal dinner with really formal persons. Well, I don't consider myself formal, but you know, I'm into this position that I might be sitting, eating mala, the lamb, tonight with you, and then I might be in a meeting with the Minister of Food in Greece after a week, and you can imagine what a big, it's a little bit like CERN, the practical lab inside my brain, because um, we are in a point, especially in my country, where we are re-evaluating what is politics and how it is related to citizenship. And what we are doing today, and we try to define as food politics, is the citizenship around food. How active and how aware are we about food? And we start with a simple question, why food matters? Um, we reach the point that we managed to put the price before food, but I think at some point we have lost the value of food. We are entrapped sometimes uh, in a mentality that good food is expensive without actually uh, questioning whether our governments really are subsidizing sugar, are subsidizing obesity, are subsidizing pesticide use. And this is actually true. Cheap food, supermarket food and fast food is cheaper because it's heavily subsidized. And then when you get actual people with actual minds and hearts and uh, hands working on the land and producing good and real food, then somehow it sounds expensive. But then at the end is a matter of priorities. That's why I think it's important to socialize the idea of food and to try to understand what is behind lands, behind the processes behind what lands on our plate. Um, there are nowadays really two mentalities to see, two approaches to look at food. One is the commodity, like that food is a commodity, and of course it controls a huge part of our economy, more than 60% of the global, the global economy has to do with agriculture. But then on the other side, you have all those people that look at food as an experience, that connects with cultural spaces, with stories, with the whole experience uh, of the countryside. There are from one side people that look food only for making money, and I think we will be laughing at ourselves in a few years. Uh, but with the fact that we have been allowing this to happen. I think in 10, 50 years we will be laughing about the fact that we are using sugar, like this chemical crystal substance that has been into our taste buds since our, the very first even days of our lives. But then on the other side you have all those people that want to preserve indigenous culture, local varieties, uh, local races, they want to preserve all the, the knowledge and the recipes. Well, those two domains, the profit making and the preservation of culture and food culture are not necessarily incompatible, but most of the times it's not working. So we are into a new era where in the open economy, the sharing economy, even the gift economy, new media is allowing more participation, is allowing for the democratization of agriculture and gastronomy. Uh, because all this knowledge suddenly becomes open code uh, and share. So it's not by accident that we have a lot of food startups all over Europe. I was discussing about you, you want to do a, a company uh, somewhere in your region dealing with food. And I'm a person that in the crisis in Greece, I survived, I'm surviving it because I created two food companies, one producing and the other consulting and distributing good food. And I think good food is probably one of the very few sectors that can work within the realms of social entrepreneurship nowadays. Uh, enterprises that are not only profit driven, but they are also generating wider benefits for the society. What we are doing here is for free today. 
but it's really a cultural capital. Um, it's actually the European cultural capital. So, really, the whole the way I perceive this uh, scaffery uh, project and the whole uh, network, uh, the, like the whole connections that we have been building over the last few months with people on site, with people. I was working on the project from Greece, for example. So nowadays, it's possible to shape food systems, local food systems. Also, I mean, the notion of local is actually now very, very wide, and so this allows us to think beyond local. Um, I really hope that uh, you people that maybe have not had the opportunity to sit next to each other before and share uh, an honest meal, you will come back together and uh, you will shape a vibrant, vibrant food community here in Umeo. And I know that there is support from big institutions like the University of the Bilbuzet, there are institutions from international networks like the one of my villages, and I am very happy to harbor my network, especially the youth network, into putting eyes on what you will be doing here, because we have, all, we have thousand reasons to do that. First of all, you have better food coming to your plate. Sanna was telling me yesterday she's ordering food from a biodynamic farm in Yerna, in southern Sweden. So when I start sharing this network, then you improve the quality of food that lands in your place. You provide incentives for more farmers to produce in a biodynamic and organic way without excluding them out of the market. So this is really a process, and it's a little bit like a language. At the beginning, we don't know how to speak it. And then we get gradually more fluent, and at the end, we are talking like our mother tongue. And I'm a person that wherever I'm going in the world, I have access to good food and good kitchens. And this, is, this just became a priority to myself. So this is at the personal level and the community level, but I believe what we really need today in the world, at the political level, is more community. We need more understanding. We need to understand that we all talk about the same things, but with different languages. And then gradually see this infecting more and more and more communities. And this is actually happening because I mean that movements like slow food is getting very massive. And even governments are looking into this uh, now because simply there are people that have been working since years to generate more profit and more votes for good food and good farming. So I really think we are in a point that we are through a paradigm shift. Do you know how many farmers, maybe the LRF can correct me, but I think only 2% of the Swedish population are farmers. Yes. Less, according to OECD, that was a couple of years ago. So, do you understand that 2% of your population is producing food for the 98%? And I admire your social structures and the infrastructures in Sweden. This is a model for us in the South, but excuse me, this is not sustainable. So, who is going to produce your food and who is going to produce our food? Is it going to be GMOs? Is it going to be machines? Is it going to be... I don't know. Are we going to live in non-food as we have been trained gradually over the last two, three decades through television advertisements, frozen dinners, synthetic biology in agriculture, and all this? So, it is a matter of really opening our eyes on what is at stake, and believe me, what is at stake is not the bank crisis in Greece. The real crisis that we are facing is the fact that there are simply too few people producing what is a life force and not a commodity, which of course can make a lot of money. But you might as well do money and generate political, uh, political mobilization for good food. And this is what we are trying to invite here as a culture. And I think this place is an amazing manifestation like this space with this registered kitchen where we can imagine this lamb we are um, eating tonight is from Rika, the farmer is about 15 kilometers outside. The lamb is called Mala. It has been grown only for this festival and I have been fighting with a lot of Mala in the last week, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> um, this farmer is complaining that the consumer thinks that the sheep smells when it gets old. The sheep. So he has to kill all the mothers young, he has to really renew his stock in rhythms, in, in rhythms he cannot sustain his income. So last week we had this workshop with the students of restaurants and culinary arts at the University, Taste of Transparency, and we came with an amazing recipe for this old lamb. We made a jerky. 
And then here's a professor of the university, here's a farmer, and they come to me and say, look guys, why don't you two come together and you come with a new product? The product that tastes amazing and it's solving the problem of the farmer. So it is all these connections that I believe a place like that um, can play a role and leave heritage outside, beyond the cultural capital and Umel's Kaferi and uh, the, the survival kit. And I would maybe suggest you that Mala becomes a symbol of food chains in Umeo. And maybe you can call this place Mala and have a nice logo with a lamb. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how we build, I think, the new politics. Uh, and it's largely based on food politics in my humble opinion. Thank you. So later on we can we can ask more to Pavlos, but I think we just go now to the next presentation, and that is of Orne Lindstrom. How do I say your name? Orne. Orne. Oh, okay. We practice that during dinner. Yeah, yeah. now it's your time. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if I was supposed to hold my speech in English. Oh, but you can do it in Swedish. Thank you. And then, uh, thank somebody you. will translate a bit for me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but perhaps the first sentence is in English. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman down, down there. Who belonged to Jordan's Vänner. And I told him, as a farmer, the friends of the earth. As a farmer, I have to be a friend of the earth. I'm a farmer, I'm the tenth generation of my farm, just outside the camp. And also the head of the farmers union in Westerbotten. But when we're talking about the earth, I think it's perhaps not a coincidence that. If you look upon the top soil from different languages, then you find that in Spain it called Terra Negra. And in Italy it's Tierra Conchimata, the fertile earth. And in France they say Tierra Vegetale. English soil, German humus, and in Icelandic and Danish, I think also perhaps, it's kind of global mode. <laughs> do, do you recognize it? No, no unfortunately, we use the word ploile, which means we focus on the hard work. Okay, and but, in the, hard work. And, but in Icelandic, at least, it's global mode. So it's just in Sweden and Finland, we have the combination with food and the earth. We say you and in Finland rakamutta. So uh, uh, now I switch to Swedish. Sorry. Uh, Men ska prata om om. Jag tror det var den höga kostnaden för det låga priset. Och det är så att maten idag, den är, även om kanske inte alla håller med om det, den är billigare än den någonsin har varit. Vi spenderar idag inte mer än ungefär 12 procent av vår disponibla inkomst på mat. Vi har aldrig någonsin behövt jobba så lite tid för att bli mätta. Och eh, det kommer ju nog självklart inte med om det, om det kan verkligen vara så, ja. Och som ett litet bevis ytterligare på det kan man ju säga, det är det att eh, man kastar ju... Sorry, sorry to disturb, but maybe when you have some pause and then maybe somebody of the audience yeah. can make a small yes, uh, abstract of what you said, because otherwise... I'm See, people listen, it's interesting, and some people okay. might. Should we do that? Yes, please. Okay. Please. Yeah. Just stop it. And who can do that? Can you do that? Or who can do that? Yes, I can do that. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, 
so it's stretch, yeah. then it will stop me when, when I use my red thread. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah. Yeah. We just said that 12% is what we spend on food of our average income now, and that is, we have never ever in history spent so little of our effort and our money on food as we do now. Och det är så också att vi kastar ju dessutom 25% av det vi köper. Vilket ju självklart styrker då min, min hypotes om att maten kanske är för billig. Här ska vi inte kasta så mycket. Och vi, vi vet ju också det att 10-20 kronor för en flaska vatten, det blinkar man inte åt. Men däremot så kan vi nästan uppror om mjölken stiger till 25 år. Så är det. Och det kan ha att göra med det faktum, min mor brukar säga det, att du ska veta det så. Det finns två saker som aldrig hittar sitt rätta väg. Och det är fritiden och fåfängan. Det hittar aldrig sitt rätta väg. Det är aldrig någon som klagar på någonting som hör fritid eller skönhetsvård eller liknande till. För det är sådana saker som man faktiskt väljer om man vill göra. Och det man väljer, det hittar man alltid motiv för. Däremot, maten kan man inte välja bort. Så den blir gärna lite för dig. Okay, so he said that um, we spend, we don't, we don't hesitate to spend 20 Swedish crowns on a bottle of water, but uh, to get people, there will be a terrible outcry if there is an increase in 25 uh, yeah, of, on the milk, on the price of milk. And also he says that uh, people do not hesitate to spend money on vanity or uh, leisure, but when it comes to uh, food, um, we don't really like to spend that much money because it's something we have to spend money on and then we want to spend as little as possible. And mm -hmm. also that we throw away 25% yes. of everything that we buy. We will yeah. okay. waste all the food. Det är så också att då gäller livsmedelsproduktion då har vi, vill jag påstå, ständigt nya krav. Vi lägger till, vi vill ha det ska vara lite mer säkerhet, lite mer trygghet, det ska vara lite mer av allt. Det är ständigt nya krav och allt annat i tillvaron. Vi accepterar att det stiger i pris. Det är nästan en naturlags självklart. Men maten ska helst inte få stiga i pris, utan den ska fortsatt vara väldigt billig. Men det är så att, som rubriken säger, att billig mat, det har ett lågt pris. Men någon, någon, någonstans får betala priset för den billiga maten. Um, there are increasingly more and more demand for food security, more, more demand for new processes to secure food in different ways, which cost more and more money, but at the same time we're not, uh, we're not really um, prepared to pay for that increase in, in, in cost that that food security actually means. So there's a discrepancy there. Um, and also somebody Somebody has to pay for this discrepancy. If, if society says that new rules and new regulation has to apply, and then you can't take it out as an increase in, in, in the price of food, uh, then I guess the point is the farmer will have to pay for this time. They saw that då inte vi betalar hela priset, då betalar som sagt bara något eller någon annan priset. Och eh, många gånger då handlar det om att djuren får sitta mellan. Miljön får sitta mellan. Människor och självklart kvaliteten. Då gäller kvaliteten, det är ju så som vi drabbas av själva i valet. Väljer vi något som är billigt, då är det också billigt gjort. Och därmed troligen sämre kvalitet. Men de övriga sakerna de 
får faktiskt någon annan betala. Och eh, eh, jag tror att eh, vi kan titta på till exempel djuren. Vi vet att om vi ska fråga folk här, alla tycker att djuromsorgen är väldigt viktig. Man skulle kanske till och med kunna säga att det är värdefullt. Men det märkliga är att för oss som producerar så är det många gånger så har det inget värde. Det är på en marknad där faktiskt det konkurrerar med sånt som djuromsorgen är på en helt annan nivå än man väljer igen. So who pays for for who pays for this um, low price of food? Um, the animals pay for the, pay the price. The environment pays the price. People pay the price, and also the quality of the food pays the price for this sort of increased cost. Um, and most people find that the uh, the care of animals is very important. And it's a valuable thing that you're actually prepared to pay for. But um, it's something that doesn't really have a value for the ones who produce food, um, care of the animals because they're not getting uh, money for it. Does that make sense? So I understand. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Perhaps we learn. Or the head. Det blir ju väldigt märkligt, för vi som producerar, vi ser ju det, vi får ju veta av alla att det är jätteviktigt. Men likväl så kryper den här viktiga produktionen. Nu är det så att hälften, varannan tugga i Sverige är importerad. Och det innebär till exempel på djurens sida, då blir det lite märkligt för att Många har synpunkter på hur de ska skötas, men snart finns det inte så många djur att ha synpunkter på. Utan produktionen produceras någon annanstans där det ingen bryr sig om våra synpunkter. Och det är det här som är det stora, stora problemet, tycker jag. Man tycker väldigt mycket, men snart spelar in om vad man tycker om. Så, so, um, every second bite of food is imported to Sweden. And people think that, believe that it's very important with how animals are treated, but at the same time, less and less animals are actually produced for food in Sweden, which means that the ability of people in Sweden to actually make demands on how uh, animals are treated uh, are increasing, decreasing, I mean. <laughs> so uh, less animals produced here, more food produced elsewhere, and less opportunities for us to um, actually um, make demands on how the food is produced. Det är så att eh, ingen mänsklig aktivitet går ju spårlöst förbi här på jorden. Inte heller jordbruk. Men jag vill mena, och vi i LRF vill mena, att vårt svenska jordbruk torde tillhöra de mest miljövänliga. Överlag, det finns varianter också i Sverige, men rent generellt tror det göra det. Och då känns det väldigt trist om det är så ställt alltså att det renaste jordbruket är det jordbruket som minskar mest produktion. Och så är det idag. Vårt rena miljövänliga jordbruk det ersätts hela tiden med något som produceras under helt andra förhållanden. Och det här är något som vi ska önska att fler riktigt förstår innebörden av. Um, agriculture has an effect on, on earth and on land. And uh, the farmers union that honor represents, they uh, believe that Sweden's agriculture is the most environmentally friendly agriculture in the world. And at the same time, this really environmentally friendly agriculture is decreasing most in production. Um, he didn't say in the world, but I assume he meant in the world, or something like that. It's decreasing a lot, anyway. Um, 
And that, that is something that is a bit of a, a mystery <laughs> um, and a problem. Min tid håller på att vara ute, får jag veta. Så jag, jag klipper lite grann i slutet. Vi har ju delat på tiden, du och jag. Men eh, bara för att förklara det riktigt absurda i mycket av det som sker. För vi vet det att vår miljö drabbas av att vi har för lite djur. Miljö utomlands drabbas för att de har för mycket djur. Varför kan vi inte få en ordentlig balans i det? Vi får dubbelkostnad för att hantera miljöproblematiken till jordbruk. Och en liten ödesurdi kan jag gärna avsluta med. Det var så att det såg på ett tv-program. Bönder i Mexiko som stod och visade en sönderbränd döda med max. Och då slog det mig det att där odlar man fast det inte är lönt för att det inte växer. Hos oss odlar man inte fast det växer för att det inte är lönt. Märkligt. Tack. Okay, so uh, the finishing uh, of this is that uh, it's it's a so absurd way that how few animals affect the environment, but at the same time in other places. Uh, many animals or too many animals affect the environment too and that you need to strike a balance between sort of animals in order to protect the environment and then he mentioned a Mexi uh, TV program about Mexican farmers producing uh, maize where it's not doesn't really grow very well and at the same time they're still producing it even though it doesn't grow well and then the idea is that here in Sweden we don't we don't grow even though it does grow so uh, we need to think about pay. it because it doesn't pay okay thank you also thank you <laughs> the next one is Morten Rasmussen um, um, that's uh, I give the mic to you and you will introduce yourself I guess and should I help you with the slides? No. You do it yourself. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I can think I skip it. Sorry. I prepared a presentation for you and if you would allow me I'll just dump it and take a few slides. Yeah. And I think what I'm going to say and I'm skipping my speech. So, if I put a bit, it would be a bit like this, attack me afterwards, okay. My name is Morten Asmussen, as, as you can hear from my accent, I'm from Denmark. I'm from Sweden, I live in Sweden, I've been for 14 years. My Swedish is Poland, so I will not expose you to that, you to that yet. Uh, I work at the Nordic, the Nordic Genetic Resource Centers, that is the joint Nordic Genetic Resource Centers. Uh, the joint, uh, uh, as I said, I work at Nordgen, Nordic Genetic Resource Centre, uh, and this is the joint Nordic Deep Bank. Uh, please stop me if I'm using uh, too much genetic lingo, and it's completely uh, not understandable. What is a gene bank? A gene bank is a collection of seeds. In this case, we also work with farm animals and forestry. Uh, but it's a collection of seeds of crop plants, useful plants, plants that we need to culture or collect, plants that we use to sustain our livelihood in our part of the world. And why do we collect, why do we have uh, gene banks and why do we collect these things? We do have these collections because this is the base for all sustainability in agriculture. Now, when I, so I'll try to put it big. Yeah. It's, like it's the question, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to put it. <laughs> uh, it's a question of sustainability. So uh, the challenges we have, we just heard uh, from the previous speaker, in economy, uh, we have genetic challenges. We have challenges of diversity. Um, to be able to produce 
And regardless if it's organic or conventional or industrial production, it doesn't matter. If you want to produce, you have to renew your crops often. This is common farmer knowledge. Those of you from farming stock, from being farmers, you know. The rest of society, they forgot it. We forgot it because we are not practically involved in farming. A farmer's fields with cereals is not just cereals. It's wheat or barley. It's an actual crop. And this actual crop, the actual barley crop, is a variety, a specific variety. This variety is exchanged every few years. If you do not exchange it, it loses productivity. Now, there's no changing. It's still the same variety. If you look at the genes, they're still there. The genetics are exactly the same. But as soon as you expose what we do in agriculture, agriculture, we, we take plant from somewhere else. We take barley from the Middle East and through five, 6,000 years, we transported these barley all the way up to here, far north, where we're producing barley. So we, we put them in, in fields. There's only barley plants. And they become, of course, exposed to pathogens. So Bipolaria sorokiniana, a very nice spot blotch causing fungi, think this is beautiful, and they attack the plants. And our pests for crop plants, they are very adaptable. I mean, they will change, they will evolve. We're dealing with biology, we're dealing with life. So of course they change, and of course they adapt, and within a few years, they can eat your crop. So you have to change your crop and come with a new variety to maintain sustainability and to maintain health. You said we've never been producing food that cheap before. We have never been producing food that clean before either. We have never been producing food with less, less toxins, and we have to acknowledge this. Now, to have these new varieties coming up every five years, six years, every two years, perhaps, depending on the crop type, we need plant breeding. So the plant breeders, they have to produce new, new varieties, do some crossing with different lines, lines or, 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 or what we call genetic resources with interesting traits. Some of these traits is that can cope with a hopelessly wet harvest which is frequent here. So we want, we want those genes that assure us that the spring wheat does not start in germination before you get it in, because then it loses every quality you can't make bread, you get just come, sometimes glue out of it. Um, so we want those genes, and we have to recombine them, so bring it next crosses, and then you want to select the optimal combination the optimal combinations, all these different 35,000 genes in the land plant. It's a long process, it's expensive. But we have to do it if we want to keep production. If not, you would be the second last generation on your farm because there's no varieties for you to produce. I'm sorry, but that's going to happen. And you close up. And it, as I said, regardless of the production system, uh, so that's why we need the gene banks. The gene banks need to collect, we need to collect, maintain, keep alive a huge variation, the biodiversity of food. And that's what we need to keep and make available for farmers, so you can actually take up an old variety and start producing it. For the breeders, so they can breed new varieties, so you can keep your productivity. Both is very important. So that's, that's what a gene bank is. Um, there, there's one thing you also have to, now when I'm talking, I, I sometimes become very international because we are a part of the FAO system, so to speak. Gene banks are linked internationally. We report to the same structures. We try to have a survey worldwide of how much we keep and maintain alive of our crop plants. Currently, we have 7.2 million accessions. Accessions, this is seed samples from gene banks. Um, if I walk away, do I? I will make an accident or something. I can help you. These accessions, this is a bag of 
the seeds of uh, what do we have here? A bee, Faseolus vulgaris, extra hatif de Julier, an old land race. The French name, I am not sure if it actually is from France. Um, I have no clue where the grows up here. But I brought a few for you, you can see what it is. 7.2 million. And what we're seeing globally is that the breeding is concentrating in five crops. We talk about the big five. Big five is not going to South Africa, go hunting and take your trophies home. The big five is wheat, maize, soy, uh, cotton, and rice. And that's where, you, that's where we do breeding. And less, more, more and more crops are becoming obsolete. Well, there's no plant breeding. It can't pay off. Because there's just this stubborn farmer here up north who wants to buy them. They'll buy the seeds. So it's no economy. It becomes too expensive. So we close breeding. And a lot of Swedish breeding has been closed down. So there's not many crops left where you have actually plant breeding going wrong. So at one point, this is going to be the bottom of the And um, uh, these, it's, it's a global problem. We have no solution to it. But this is what's going on now. I want to, to finish with um, a few pictures of the, uh, now I'll just rush through this, because this was a different talk. This is from the G-Bank, you can see what the G-Bank is. And this is explanation of reading. Ah, here we go. Uh, because securing the, these, uh, this genetic variation is, is a global task. And we are proud to be the operators from the, our rich and wealthy neighbors in Norway. They created the global seaport. And you specifically asked me to explain what that is. Well, it's a security storage. Gene banks are important. We deliver seeds for breeders, we deliver seeds for the universities all over the world. But sometimes accidents happen. We had a flood in uh, Southeast Asia, and one national gene bank, a local creek, turned into a river within a few hours. The river turned directions, and all the material from the gene bank is on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. That happened within a very few hours. And with extreme weather being more frequent, we are exposed to a situation where the banks get destroyed. So Norway decided to open <coughs> Svalbard. Svalbard is here, close to the, to the North Pole. Uh, they decided to build a global facility. You can see the top of it at the, here. That's how it looks. You can see the, the guy below. This is the, the, the airport of Longyearby, Svalbard. And you have the entrance, it looks like this. What is it? It's, it's a hole in the ground, it's a hole in the mountain. So it's very simple. But this very simple thing has got a lot of attention because we can explain why it's important by showing these images. When you come into it, you have a tunnel, and you have a security door, and at the end you have another tunnel, and when you come to that end, you have a frozen door. On the other side of the frozen door, you have the bolt. The vault is a huge chamber. We have three chambers, um, and you have uh, a, a normal industrial storage system with boxes with the seeds from the gene banks of the world. We have frozen down the mountain to minus 18 degrees. It's a permafrost area, so there's always minus 4 degrees. But we've frozen it down to minus 18, which is the standard to conserve seeds. So we receive boxes of seeds from all over the world, and we store them there, we put them up as a database. We urge the gene banks not to send double of, of same sample. Please send the unique ones so we can make sure that they, we keep them there forever. And at the moment, we have more than 40% of the world's genetic resources there, of the unique genetic resources there, and it's still coming in, and they will continue coming in over the next couple of years. This guy is Oren van Botman, professor of plant breeding from Swedish Agricultural University. He's been working for us for six years now, explaining what this is, flying around the world, explaining what it is, why we're doing it, and uh, the reasoning behind it. And he's created a lot of attention. 
So that works for me now, I think. I brought two things. This is a nice mixture of peas, of the different peas, colors, types, shapes, surfaces. Have a look at it. This is diversity. And that's what we want. If we do not have this diversity, we can't do it. And then the, I brought these uh, fascios, beans, barn beans. Uh, our curators say they are exquisite, so we would want you to try to grow them. Be aware that whatever we deliver, there's a text, because we are, we are operating within a legal framework. So you cannot take this and start a business. You can take it and go home and use it for your private use, mm -hmm. but as soon as you change that, come back to us. You need to sign an agreement. Okay? <laughs> we will take care of that then. Okay, but thank you, and um, yeah, people can come to you and get a yes. seat back then. Okay, um, the next one is the, um, I have to tell, I have to say your name right. Um, Gunther Fenberg, you will tell us something about the dairy farm, so please. So I should try to take a part of it in English, but then I will do like Arne and uh, switch over if it's needed. Well, my name is Gunnar Wendberg and I'm a dairy farmer. A three and a half my, uh, Swedish miles from here in Nyliden. The farm is named Nyliden's Ekogård. And uh, we started this project, like, uh, actually I have been interested in farming and especially help with my self-sufficiency. 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 Yes, <laughs> uh, from a very young age. And uh, in fact I heard this uh, John Seymour's uh, book is coming uh, in a new uh, printing now, but I was uh, uh, seeking it in the library and uh, uh, other places to read and was very excited. I also have farmers in my, I mean my um, grandma and grandpa was farmers, so I had it backwards. But uh, I'm a grown up uh, out in Stockholm, and in that uh, media it wasn't um, very common to be a farmer, and in those days it wasn't even this uh, uh, trend uh, uh, some, uh, as now. I think uh, actually uh, it has changed a lot. but. Uh, I have met a lot of uh, um, very much motstand uh, on different sets. I have, yeah, when I have tried to choose a school to go to training, so I had to say to the consultant that it was a bit too much work. It was a stupid thing to want to be a farmer. But I stand fast, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, my husband and I uh, bought a small farm uh, and in uh, 2000. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we had this idea of self-sufficiency, so we, wanted, uh, we didn't want to borrow money, and uh, so we, we bought a very small farm because we couldn't afford more. But then we have saved the money and we have a plan for, from 2004 to make a dairy. And 
this year in January, uh, we started the dairy production. Uh, and why, uh, why was our decision to leave this self-sufficiency to be producer them for some years, the com consumers? Well, uh, I think uh, this was some kind of process. We really enjoyed this type of food we produced for ourselves, but we also wanted to share it with other people. And then you have to sell it in some way or another. Uh, and But you also find out that uh, this lifestyle was uh, very, uh, I mean, people was provo uh, uh, yes. And uh, we thought maybe if, uh, maybe people don't see the good intention in this uh, without uh, being a bit more normal. So we have made some compromises in our life. And, uh, but we haven't actually, uh, we still have this idea of self-sufficiency because uh, now when we are producing milk and we, uh, we don't uh, feed our cows with, uh, I mean we have uh, uh, this uh, ecological uh, farming, Kramer, uh, and uh, we have also the idea that cows are going to milk for our own food. Uh, we produce the food for the, for the cows ourselves or in the neighborhood. Uh, and the, this of course when you, uh, and we also try to make the milk very much in, uh, well, Vete, Pera, or Ensilage. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yes, uh, hay and fermented hay and uh, uh, yes, uh, grass, grass and uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so uh, and we also have this fjäll uh, kor, uh, it's an old breed. Yeah. That's the breed of the cow? Yeah, yeah, cool. Mommy, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I saw them on the website. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, they are. Uh, I mean, they have been uh, uh, mostly we did uh, most of the farmers in Sweden didn't have them because they milk they didn't make so much and they don't make so much. But we have found out that they are quite suitable. To this type of production because we have, haven't this, I mean, we want them to meet as much as possible on this uh, diet. And uh, then it would be another thing because if you have a cow uh, with genes saying milking very much, then it becomes uh, uh, too uh, thin after a while, and then it just has to stop because it, it won't die of milking. But the, it's uh, yeah, they are uh, they are making it quite. Uh, uh, I mean, they don't milk too much, but they milk lot of money. Yes. Maybe you can say where your farm is, and if you can. Yes, it's yeah. in Venice. I, did, I didn't say that. But uh, you can also see a bit of our, uh, our... We have a video on minfarm.se. You can look there and you can also taste our milk and uh, färskost. Uh, soon when uh, we start eating here. And uh, I think it's very good that uh, many people are... are like uh, our products, but it's also good that we have, uh, since January, we have, uh, uh, we have 
now we have uh, employees for uh, two half times, and we are still growing. So we can see that this. I mean, we have an idea that you could. Uh, in fact, we didn't accept this that you couldn't live on a small farm. And of course, it's a difference between having. Uh, we have an average uh, 20 crowns per liter for our milk. So of course, it's a difference between delivered to, for example, normal milk. But uh, you can also see that we have lots of work. So we can actually don't, don't, we have the same problem actually because uh, all our income is going to the employees. <laughs> so I don't think we have had it in in this uh, day. Now we have it where uh, it's larger, but uh, in fact uh, we take it out, out in time. It, it's the same thing. Uh, so I, I recognize that when you say someone is paying. We are working free. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of paying. Yes, that's a kind of paying. But um, we uh, actually we think that this is the way to go. But uh, the, even, uh, I mean, there are there are people thinking our product is very very expensive. But uh, in fact, we are working freely ourselves, and our employees are taking the. And in fact, we have this. Uh, Type of land with drag and from the so it, our employees haven't uh, either. Uh, I mean, they got their uh, some of the pay from Swedish state. So, so actually, uh, even if uh, our products are, are more expensive, they, they aren't enough expensive. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Should I stop there? Much more to tell. Yes, in fact, I have. But we can do that later on, also. Or is there some final note? Well, I think it's very positive that this interest about the quality of the food is increasing now. And I think, I mean, there are people in Sweden also don't have work and we have actually given the opportunity for people having work here in the agriculture so there you have another point in why food is uh, actually it's important to produce food it's for I mean the you have to have the opportunity to live even when you're not living in a town in Sweden so ah I, I Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I learned a new breed of cows today. I never saw that before. So thank you. Um, later on, we will also come back to the products and everything. Um, now I want to ask as the last speaker, um, and uh, that's Susanna Yot. And then we arrange the table and then the, the things come. And I want to thank you first for doing the translations. And now you come in with your own story. So, Suzanne. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at translating because usually I like to speak one language at a time. You did good. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Susanne York and I, um, I'm a human geographer. I did my dissertation in Umeå. Um, for a very long time, and I finished it in 2009, and it was about rural migration, mostly. It was a bit about other things as well, because I was at it for quite a few years, so I did a lot of different things in my dissertation, but mainly it was about rural migration, and my curiosity was, the, my curiosity was why do people move to the countryside, but I didn't answer that in my research. I answer the question, who moves to the countryside? Because I think that's an interesting question as well. Who is prepared to actually move to the countryside? But leading from that, after I finished my PhD, I went to the UK for a year and a half in search of sort of more cultural geography. Um, the connection between rural and people and how people live their lives and how people interact with the rural 
and how people not necessarily living in rural areas also interact with rural areas. So um, I was there for a year and a half, mainly teaching, but also learning a lot about sort of these connection, connections. And got to think about how, how, what land means to people. Because when I did this research about migration to rural areas, I came across a lot about and sort of the back to the land movement from the 1970s, when people, what was called in Sweden the Green Wave, people moved from the cities to the countryside. Mainly, if you look at the statistics of that movement, mainly it was about, the truth about it was that people moved from the cities to suburban areas. That was a time when, when, when people, when, when cities grew sort of uh, in a, a more geographical or surface uh, way, and that was interpreted as a green way. But of course then there were all these people who moved into the countryside and started breeding goats and, and, and intentional communities and all that that grew in the 1970s. But I was really interested in, in sort of this process of the people who actually, who actually moved to the countryside and, and wanted to live there. And also I got curious about people actually wanting to live in the countryside. Because one of the main ideas in recent years in, in Swedish regional policy has been something uh, that translates into regional enlargement. The idea is that you take a city like Umeå or Stockholm, and the idea is that you want to create as much communication between that central place and whatever is surrounding it. So you want to facilitate commuting. That has been sort of the core of, of regional policy in the last few years in Sweden. But I, I thought that was a stupid idea because um, I've always been a bit of a secret and um, sort of environmental activist. So uh, to me it was crazy to move people to two cities. I want, I'm curious about people actually living in the countryside and making their lives in the countryside. Um, so I wasn't really keen on this idea of the regional enlargement. So I started thinking about this process of moving back to the land and people actually doing it. And I got in touch with researchers that did research on indigenous peoples and their connection to land. I got really, really interested in, in, in how that connection works. I mean, indigenous peoples, it's so much ingrained in the culture, this, this connection to land. But most people in, in Sweden have lost this connection to land and is it possible to, to find people who are still connecting to land and, and why are they connecting to land and, and how does it work? So um, I came back to Sweden and um, different roads and different happenings have done different things. Um, I worked uh, in different universities and last one was the Swedish Agriculture University, which I left a month ago and decided I was going to be a green entrepreneur myself. I wanted to live, instead of thinking about and, and wanting to do research on the issue of, of people actually living their lives where they live, rather than commuting. Because I was commuting from Sarah, which is not very far, but it's still about 15 minutes by car. And I was thinking about, can I actually live my life where I live? So that's where I am now. I'm trying to find some way to live off the land where I live and live my life there. So that's why I'm sort of interested in this project, the connectivity between food, because I'm trying to grow food as well, and, and, and land, and the urban and the rural. Okay, so that's why. <laughs> I think we now go to the next level and that's a real dinner and then after that I have for all people um, that were speakers a question but also of course you can uh, during the dinner have conversations but also enjoy your dinner. I think we have to rearrange a bit, maybe also take care that you're sitting next to people that speak your language and, um, if, and also see if we have enough seats, um, we could make a, a new seat here. So I think it's not also only the food. No, it's there. also we are afraid uh, um, to the different at the end, and this creates a sense of insecurity. 
And this makes us hide behind what the television sends us. Like when Kellogg's tells us that we need to eat Kellogg's cornflakes every morning so we can get better grades at school. Apparently, there are a lot of people that believe it. But this is, but like this is this is like if you think anthropologically, like how stupid are we becoming? You know, like and this is what I mean by that we are afraid of diversity because there are like how many accessions of maize? Hundreds at least. You have thousands of accessions of maize, but it's a bad example of maize. It's a very bad example because maize is one of the big five. It means that the global plant breeders they would have huge collections of maize within the systems because they care. You should ask for how many accessions do we have of the minor crops? How many do we have of rye? Not very much. Not enough. I was mentioning maize because this is what is being advertised and what they advertise is like single crop, single, single, single genotypes. And this is exactly the trap that we are falling because those companies that do not care for your health or our health, they care about the profits, which is fine, but uh, we see more challenges and uh, we want a more open food system where there is more, more uh, decision making to the consumer himself and this comes through information and awareness, not through blind, hiding behind what they pass you. And we, uh, this is what I mean that we are afraid of diversity. And it's too complex also like I think like like the societies in general are afraid maybe to tackle diversity because it's just more complex, requires more analytical thinking. It is way easier to have a homogenized food system, a homogenized health system. And if you go out there on a Sunday morning, most people have the same clothes, drive the same cars, eat the same thing. Like, isn't it astonishing to think like hundreds and how like, many, 700,000 Big Macs sold every day? How many people are eating the same thing? And this is part of the problem, in my opinion. We have a reaction. A re reaction, yes. Yeah. No, we're not. Uh, being afraid of diversity, it's crazy. We can only survive by maintaining diversity, and it goes for everything. If we try to avoid diversity, we can dig the grave now. So, so it's really, I, I, I'm reacting quite strongly <laughs> against it. Uh, not all our food, no matter how we look at it, all our livelihoods, and it's not just food, it's your garden, it's your ornamentals, it's having nice flowers to look at, having trees and bushes to protect you against the wind, it's whatever you have of livelihood in an area dependent on plants. They, the, the plants provide the feed for your animals, for your, for your meat, for your eggs, whatever you eat, and we must have the diversity to cope Think about the climate change predictions. We had just a month ago, we had the Nordic Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, and it was quite scary for me. I was organizing a, a conference in Iceland with a Nordic partnership of, a public-private partnership for what we call pre-breeding, that is bridging the gap from plant science to plant breeding. This might be very nerdy to you, but it's really a field that misses attention. So we're trying to work with this in an audit level. We're starting, we're taking off slowly. We had a meeting in Iceland, and we got one of the best climatologists from the University of Lund participating, and he showed us future scenarios based on, I think, from the top of my head, believing it was 18 different models. <coughs> they were scary. And now we came in Copenhagen here a month ago, and we saw the new reports and the new scenarios. And we can forget about a temperature raise of two degrees. We're talking about between four and six degrees. So it's much more severe climate change and it's going to strike you guys up here. It's going to be more, more severe north, it's going to be more severe, which was new to me, around the Baltic Sea. Because the deep water, you have more than a kilometer deep water between Sweden and Estonia. That's where the ferry is on the bottom there. This bathtub of water is going to be heated up which means you're going to have a longer growth season, you can actually produce more up here. Uh, you're also go going to have a much more instable climate and you will need new crop plants. So, for God's sake. So, you underline that we... Diversity. Diversity. <laughs> you should be scared to death by the lack of diversity. Right, you say that we should be afraid of diversity. Okay, you want to say something? So, here is the mic. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
In fact, I have a, I have a feel this uh, scare of diversity on my own body <laughs> into my skin. I mean, when you are starting to have a small farm, not the, I mean, uh, if two percent of the um, uh, is uh, farmers totally, and then. Of that amount, I suppose there are very, very small enough being farmers on a very small farm with having horses to make <laughs> to drive in the fields, <coughs> and also we have a we have a, a felt that uh, I mean many people are positive, but there are also lots of people being very uh, upset and uh, uh, I think uh, threatened about this uh, being uh, different. And so I think there's a problem between, uh, I mean, we, we need new ideas, new things to, we have to try uh, different ways to fix things. And uh, if we don't let each other being different to each other, then everyone will do the same until we all uh, will <laughs> go. Uh, yes. So we will so. fail together when we fail. We yes, 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 at least we will be together. <laughs> so actually, what you, oh, sorry. what you say is you are against a form that has monoculture. Yes, but it's not uh, only the monoculture in farm, I mean monoculture in the, the society. Mm -hmm. Yes, because yeah, I, think. Um, I think maybe it's a Swedish problem that we are, uh, I mean, we have had this uh, uh, Lutheran church uh, 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 culture for 500 years, and I'm not against that, but I think maybe we have been used to uh, the thought about everybody's uh, going to behave the same and think the same and so on. And I think it's uh, this, this uh, it, it's not good for the society, especially not when we have this. Uh, I mean, you can see that in the modern culture, the agriculture. I mean, if you have different crops, to, this year, for example, it was very dry in the summer, and the, the we used to have very much carrots, but they didn't even grow uh, because it was too late. Of course, but the, I mean, it can it can happen. And but then we have also cabbage, so we have uh, enough with uh, vegetables anyway. So you can see that I think it's the same in the society that if you have different uh, ideas about how to do things. Then you will have more diversity, both in in the biological way, but also in the way uh, shaping the society. Yes. Um, I have there, yeah, not that I have experience there, <laughs> but I had once uh, talked to a grower, and that said to me, monoculture was better for him because he had to check the biological salads and I wanted to grow six different kinds and he said, my that God, that's hard. I said, why? And he said, yeah, because I go there with my eye every day and have to check the salad and then now I have to reset my brain every time I look at a, at a different crop. And um, so he better had thousands or uh, six thousand of one kind than he had as a human for, uh, he needed more, it cost him more energy to do six uh, different types. So I thought it was quite interesting that he had, um, yeah, when he wanted to do it efficiently and without, just by checking it by eye, the plants, he said monoculture uh, was better for him. So that I wanted to have six uh, times, six types, he did it. But that was more work for him. And I thought that was fascinating. Uh, you have an answer in this, and uh, Patros also has maybe something to say about it. Let's just bring up my story. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, we. Uh, <laughs> 
Oh, oh, wait, it's not on. Oh. No, 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 it's on, it's on. Yes, I didn't touch this. <laughs> well, in fact, we have, a, we have felt a bit, we have feel a bit in that way too, because we had, for example, sheep, but we have stopped having sheep because we think this uh, different type of uh, animals made, I mean, every single different part mm -hmm. would make some extra work. So. I, I understand thinking, but but uh, you can also see that now we have horses and we have cows and uh, and pigs. That I I mean we use this um, uh, horse and cow. They, they will uh, go on the land different years, and you don't have so much parasite yet. Uh, but um, uh, I mean they don't be ill when they are going. Uh, Grazing, uh, when you can uh, have different types of animals and so on. So, so I mean, if we uh, had had the horses, then it would be a very big problem not having the sheep. But now we we can manage. Yeah. So there's but a the limit in the in the in the different kinds of uh, skills you can do have on one day. Uh, I I mean, you can always. Uh, there are. The, there are always uh, good and bad to have differences. But I, I was reading in a book for farmers from the start of the 19th, mm -hmm. 20th century, I mean. Uh, and there they mean that it was very dangerous for farmers to have only one crop. For if I mean the if you fail or if the uh, I mean if you can't sell the crop. Then you have to blow all, all things down yeah. and then oh. Maybe Arne can say something about that. <laughs> With statistics, maybe, you never know. I, I, I think also, to be a very skillful farmer, you have to specialize. Mm. I don't think you can be a, an expert on every topic. Yeah. As well as a, a farmer in your other life. I think you have to specialize in, in some way. Well, I think just a comment. I mean, if you look at what, what has been available for farmers of varieties, this has decreased immensely during the last 20, 25, 30 years. So you would, you would have access to a number of, of varieties up here, and you haven't got access to those anymore. And, and I, I don't remember if I said it before, but please remember plants does, we, we travel east-west, or plants travels east-west. If you, you grow them here, probably somewhere in Canada you can grow them as well. Uh, but they, you can't grow them in Sicily. You can't move varieties up and down north-south because of the light. Plants are adapted to a certain amount of actually darkness. Remember that. Or light. Or, well, actually they, have to, they have to rest a certain amount of hours. If not, they stress themselves to death. <laughs> and that's the reason why we, we had potatoes coming back with one of the first ships after Columbus. But we never grew, grew potatoes before the early, 18, early 19th century, simply because they couldn't produce up here. They, they can't reproduce and they can't produce. So we do have limitations and we need variation. Coming back. I think uh, we, should go, not, we should not get into the trap of start like showing Case, cases of like, I know this farmer that is better off with the big farming or the monoculture, or I know this farmer that is uh, that wants like uh, polyculture and so on. Like, we should really again be open in diversity. 85% of Greek farmers are small farmers. To have this farmer, for whatever reason, to grow industrial cotton and have someone in a stock market in Liverpool, whatever, decide the price of the cotton. You destroy him. In 10 years, you don't have farmers. And this is the mother of the crisis in Greece. So every country, every system, every economy has a different food system and a different farming system. And within the context of the European Union, this is a huge challenge. The European Union was pretty much created for the common agricultural policy. The biggest policy is like 60% the, the of the budget goes there. And this is a huge challenge to deliver one single common agricultural policy for something so diverse. Now, setting aside that, I think that we should really redefine, given, I mean, 
I'm a young scientist. I probably come from a different generation, but what I'm, I was trying to tell my professors and I'm trying to share with you is that like when we were studying and researching, the world just got so open. We got exposed to how messed up is the world because of Facebook, because of social media, because of whatever media. So all this problematic is, was really integrated when we were between 22 and 20 and 30 into our lives. So it doesn't really make sense to us all this mainstream thinking in agriculture. And I understand that we have to meet in the middle of the bridge. I just feel, as a biodiversity scientist, that we need to redefine what is productivity and integrate more criteria, more indicators into this definition, and especially also put issues like food culture, because these are so vital. If we want to have the 2% of farmers being 20% and 50%, then we need to make our rural areas more livable. And believe me, I, I find it very difficult to get convinced that we will make them more livable by introducing, for example, GMO technologies. We might have better yields, but then we will have better yields of one thing. Let's really discuss a little bit what is food security, what is feeding the world. I guess in today's world, feeding the world means feeding every life on Earth. I guess, yes. And apart from that, we have to understand, okay, we increase the yields, we produce more grain, more of the five, or the five we do seven, or we invest a few more trillion dollars and we do the 700. But then again, are we going to nourish them? I don't know anyone that is just feeding with rice and wheat. We did not feed with rice and wheat. And we are able to make this discussion because we do not only eat bread. <laughs> so, so say it again. We are able to do this discussion because we went beyond the, red, the bread and the rice. Mm -hmm. So diversity again. You are a milk farmer. Don't you think it's stupid the fact that we are banning the raw milk? Okay, I mean, there is a big argument of the legislation, of course. If I'm bringing milk from Holland to drink in Greece, yet, then yes, there has to be some more regulations. But if I shift to a more local system where I go to the milkman and I interact, is it better for you as a milkman? I say the same for olive oil. 80% of the olive oil you drink out there is fake. And this makes my life difficult. Because the big olive oil press in my village is faking. But he is the best olive oil of Greece. This is who is rewarded. Exactly because we are afraid of diversity. We are afraid of the new. But what is then the fake? It's a fake. It's mixture. It's mixing. It's mixing. It's a mixture know? of kinds Other of oil. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. It's happening with everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. The lamb you will get in the most expensive. Um, restaurant in, in Umeo, it will not be as original as this lamb. It will be way more better cooked, I can tell you. But, but we have to put more criteria on what we define as good and what we define as right. And I'm, I'm hoping to convince also you, <laughs> because you are probably sitting in a more important yeah. chair than I am. Yeah, maybe a short reaction and then Arne also, can you react or are you... Not at all. Just, just a comment on the fake food. Uh, we have been producing three European applications with participations of some of the strong uh, food scientists from Greece, Ireland, Scotland, well, quite a number of countries in Europe, uh, where we were involved as your only gene bank. Because I do believe that we can use genetics as a marker to trace food identity. Yeah. And believe, you should believe my, my neighbor here that this is yeah. absolutely true. It's huge sums of money. I, sorry, in, Lord, I have in to interrupt food. you. Yeah. Arne is, is leaving now. We, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, there's a reason you have to leave earlier. And uh, thank you for both coming over. Bye. 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 <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but I didn't no, want to, no, exactly. that he sneaks <laughs> out. No, because this is a huge uh, market, and, and it's, not, it's not just high-profile Greek olive oil, it's common foods, it's plain food. Tulip sausages are faked. Come on, that's just about the worst thing you can buy. No, so, not, I mean, not against the company there at all, no. but, but just that you, it, it's... A huge problem, and we can solve it. So we okay, can it's, it's clear to me now what, what's fake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.
problem is that the, the food choices of the consumer don't exist. But it's what they are trying to We are back. We are back to the fact that the food is too cheap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The problem is that the food is too cheap. Yeah. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too cheap. The problem is that the food is too Uh, when you produce, I mean, we don't use any fake fermented <laughs> sets there, so but if, additives. I mean, if you should do like this uh, fresh boost, I. Uh, oh. <laughs> I mean, uh, this fresh boost, we we um, we take yogurt and we put it in the uh, very. Uh, fine clean uh, duk, and uh, and the uh, vasle uh, will come out of it, and it will be thick. But if you look at the ingredients in uh, the normal vegetables, you can see you have this uh, perhaps yogurt or cream or something, and then you have mere pulver, uh, and so on, and then they have just put into the yogurt and put all this. Um, And this was on the table, or should we do it around now yeah, so people so, can so smell it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I have. Yeah, sorry. I have a question here, and more people can come here and have questions or uh, grip the other mic. But uh, here's your mic. Hello, my name is Magnus. I'm a teacher. I'm wondering what's the most important tool to change the monoculture? Should we put taxes on them? Should we put the best lobbyists on the politicians? Or what should we do as individuals? I think, uh, I think if, we dis if we discover how powerful we are, I mean, I don't know about you, but it, it's very hard for me to earn my money nowadays. So I think more where I put my money. And uh, the, the choice of the consumer is huge. And I think, let's not make it sound that we are in a, in a, in a disagreement. I, uh, because the food system is an alive, an alive system. And it is comprised of a series of interconnected processes that range from the microscopic level, the genetics, for example, all the way to global challenges like the food waste. So in my opinion, it is so complex. And I think the biggest enemy is ourselves. So it, is, it really boils down, because we are more and we have more scale, the power of scale, that we really sit down and think and reprioritize what exactly we want to be heading to. And I think this is the importance of such discussions, because at least we discuss about this. And I have witnessed in my country, in my society, this change in the topic, what, what, on what is interested the society. Five years ago, we would only talk about cars and big houses. Now people talk about food and about this future. So this shift is, is happening. Again, with the current system, the current consumption patterns, every farming system is necessary. Also the big monocultural system. Yes, if we agree that like we have to shift in more diversity in the field, in our plate, wherever, then yes, we have to see what is the most feasible way, the easiest feasible way. Um, reaction also here from. I'm just thinking about one issue that came up here, and that was the issue of our consumers' choices. And I, th I think that it is important that we are a force and, and we have power in the way we consume things. But it's so easy, I think, to forget all the people who do not really have choices, the people who lack resources to make the choices that I can make as a sort of middle class person living in a in a country with a lot of money. And I think, I think that is why it has to move from being just an issue on what you buy to an issue of what you 
what we produce and how we produce it has to be lifted to, to a political level. I think what you're saying about Greece is true. When you, when you face sort of a situation where food becomes important because that's the baseline of what you, you need shelter and you need food, you need water. And when one of those things, when you're really poor, you start thinking about food as well. But I think quite often here, when we discuss food quality, it's sort of in the buy more ecological food or buy locally produced or whatever. I think we need to engage the wider public. I had um, a fam homeless family staying with me last year and I realized how much our cultures clashed, not only because we were from different uh, countries originally, but also because of sort of the, the culture of what we consume and how we sort of handle food and, and, and things around that. Because they would buy the cheapest food possible, always. They wouldn't consider anything else when they were buying things. Just basically that. And, and, and I have all sorts of hang-ups when I, I, mean, when I go to shop. I, I, I want to buy ecological stuff, I want to buy local stuff. But I can make those choices. And there's so many people who can't make the choices or do not know enough to make those choices. And I think we need to think about that and how we can sort of get people thinking about these issues in a wider perspective. I hope that made some sense. Reaction, you want to? Yes, just, just, a, just a, a, a comment here because uh, having the choice, we're not using, us having the choice actually not using it. Uh, we changed in, uh, this is a long time ago, back in 1996, the Danish cereal research. At that time, at that time I was a plant reader in Denmark, and uh, we got a nice Swedish scientist over to pick on the Danes, which was quite productive. Uh, so we got this change, and a part of the work leading up to this uh, uh, rearrangement uh, was a study on consumer behavior showing that 20% of the Danish consumers are willing to uh, pay more for food if they perceive a certain quality. Could be ecological, could be local, could be uh, a certain quality, could be uh, Greek cheese, it could be whatever. 80% goes directly for the lowest price. Now, the same study has been carried out a number of times on the European Union level. Sweets, you're just as bad. 80% go directly for the low prices, and the figure hasn't changed. New Nordic Food has been a program running for more than 10 years. We are still picking up the cheapest food. The same in Germany, the same in England, the same in France. The only region in Europe separating is parts of Spain, or the regions, is parts of Spain and northern Italy. Greece is the same. It's very sad. Hmm. I wanted to say that like, nowadays, also ignorance is a choice. What? Ignorance is also a choice yes. nowadays. And I think it's an immoral people to be, I mean, at least the part of the humanity that has access to the internet all over this free information. I'm saying that I have every right to say that because I generate a lot of free content <laughs> to mm -hmm. sort of educate the market and society. And this is a choice as well. I don't say that we can change from one day to another. It's very complex. It's huge. But then I know that there is so much technology, innovation, and all this marvelous science that we can use to the benefit. I mean, I think food waste is man-made, and food waste can be amended by man. Same, of, same with productivity. Same, I mean, there are issues that we can really, uh, we, we can really um, solve merely by socializing ideas. I've seen a lot of people transforming their own diets, and with that, slowly transforming those societies, because if we talk with market terms, sometimes you just need to generate a need. I think that here, maybe, I don't know, here is 40 people, maybe five of you have the need to sit around the table with another 30 people you don't know, the way you go into a room and do yoga with another 30 people you don't know. And this is where you generate a need. Hmm? Like big farming, industrial food exists because there is a need. Someone was generated. And we can discuss how this was generated by companies like Coca-Cola <laughs> and by companies but, like McDonald's, yeah. you know. But Why don't we, can, cannot we socially organize and change the agenda? It's self-preservation after all. I mean, science, I mean, nature is teaching us homeostasis. Yeah, but there are other things also. It's in a way, um, 
it's also what you uh, said a few times and also what I know is that um, there are also not a lot of young people that want to go into farming. It's not popular, it's not cool to be farming. <laughs> Maybe in art the last five years it's cool to talk about, but you know, in general. So, and what you also in a way say is there's information enough, you know, it's not the access to information, but it's the choice to ignore the information. So, in a way, that's a kind of same problem that you, in a way, you do not want to have that other story popular, or you do not want to have the dilemma, in a way, in, in a big public uh, for So, that's, uh, that's a double problem, that also diversity of growers and of farmers is also uh, the, the age going up. So, I, think. I um, just, we have uh, just to respond one minute. Yeah, here. one minute. It's yeah. like that in this week that I'm here, everyone is asking me how is Greece doing with the economy and all this. Yeah, I have to tell you what the journal is telling you is like very far away from what the reality is. And I'm saying that because there are a lot of young people going back to the land and rediscovering land traditions and they're trying to find ways out of the economic crisis. And the fact that I'm here is a manifestation of that. And apart from that, I also want to say that. Uh, um, no, I have a plan now. <laughs> but um, but it is the, the uh, you can say Europe-wide, worldwide, wide. It's not a popular choice. Uh, people have uh, problems to get new growers. Uh, first, Angela wants to say something. The, the problem for new younger people. Yeah, yeah. The problem yeah. for the problem for younger people to get. Uh, to start a farm or anything, you can hear me this way too, uh, is that uh, they haven't got the money. It's too expensive to buy a farm or start up a farm. It's, you get to have some millions Swedish crowns to start one. And that's the problem for the new one. Everybody hasn't been so lucky as I have <laughs> to get a big farm. But in another way, if you if you grow just one kind, you you got to, it's not good. You got to have many eggs in the basket because if one fails, you can leave on the other ones. If you have just got one kind, then you have uh, you also have the same kind, and you and you because it was. The, Giving you the market the, the, is over Yes, yeah. and uh, it fails. When the market drops, so you can't sell it, then you've got to eat properly for one year and have no money to buy new seed to grow new. So you've got to have many eggs to stand on, and you've got to help younger people to become farmers. Yeah. There's a mic also in your corner, so I mean... I, I, I would like when you speak in a mic, I have hearing aids, so I cannot hear you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, there's a third one. Yeah. Uh, um, can I come back? Okay. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, we are talking about... Uh, I mean... Even if we bought the farm very cheap because it was very bad, <laughs> actually. <laughs> bad soil or never, bad country? Never, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't taken care of, oh, okay. uh, yeah. yes. but yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, but in fact, we, uh, we had the opportunity because we had work. Uh, I mean, we could earn our money, but there are many people actually today, uh, I have uh, uh, hired one, one, for example, uh, or two, actually. Uh, they want to be farmers, but the, their income will not be enough for uh, uh, save anything. And then you haven't got even this small amount of money to buy a very cheap farm. Yeah. So, of course, there are more interested people than the people uh, have, having the opportunity. But then I think it's another problem, and that's the uh, thing that 
there are, uh, I mean, I can't say it's impossible because we have actually done it, but we have also have incomes from other ways. But, I mean, if, if you can't live on a small farm, then the farm c couldn't grow either. So, I mean, uh, if you don't have this very big money, then you have to start with a small farm. But if you can't live on a small farm, then it don't become a big farm. And it's exactly the same thing that you have to, in every company, you have to start with a little one and then you will grow. Yes, so. Your question. Uh, well, I didn't have an actual question. I just had a comment. Uh, I work uh, in bread production. And what I wanted to say is that it's all a system, actually. The world is system. And that the thing is that even if we want to produce a bread, which is really great and it's not monoculture, the supermarket is going to say, well, we are not taking this in. How long is it staying on the shelf? And so on. And then there needs to be a consumer need. And there needs to be a, a legislation which pushes forward something. So it's a very complex system, I think, and that, that's what is important. Not just uh, my personal belief, but that mm -hmm. everything in this system clicks. That's, uh, I think, in, so when we are working with this and when we are discussing, we really, really need to have a view of the whole system. Because just one motivated person does not make a difference. It needs to be all the way around. So to start a farm or to start an agri-related business, you would say you also need to take care together of the network of distribution and also find that. Yeah. So is, yeah. can you sell your product? Yeah. And if you can sell it, is there is there a customer buying yeah. it? And then, you know, like this whole system. So yeah. even, for example, even if we want to make a change, um, mm -hmm. Maybe there is not a supermarket who wants to take in your product, and then your product is not getting sold. So that's, yeah, it's a system. That's just the, uh, and, yeah, okay. Just to comment on that, um, for, for the seed system, access to uh, diverse seeds, uh, this is actually, uh, has been discussed. I mean, it's not only up here you have the problem, it's all over, over Europe. So there's a new European seed legislation uh, discussed. We expected it to be decided this spring. The parliament sent it back. So the new parliament, let's see if they manage to decide upon it. But uh, that will open up for uh, trade with, di with more diverse crops, crop seeds. So, so there's something is going on there. And another issue on the, on the uh, diversity in production, uh -huh. we do have technologies that allows us to produce and separate after harvest. So this is, I think, it's not legislation that much. It's actually due to conservatism in the, uh, in the industry. We've had results for uh, Scotch research for more than 10 years showing that you can produce variety mixtures with high quality for malt in barley, and you can do the same in bread. So we have the science, we have the results. It's just conservatism in the industry. Uh, I can take a small example. In this. Um, we was uh, informed last year that um, if you are go going to sell potatoes now in the European Union, you, yeah, you are, maybe you know that, you have to have some kind of um, number and you will pay for that, a lot of money. Uh, and. If you don't have this uh, number for, uh, I mean, uh, the intention is that the, if a farmer uh, export potatoes, then it shouldn't be uh, sickness or something, and it's very good. But I mean, I have this small uh, potato growing and uh, just sell for people around. Uh, but I, I have actually done it uh, also uh, having a small store selling my potatoes but now when this quite big expensive will come then uh, then I uh, we decided not to sell the potatoes in the shop because uh, it won't be uh, I mean we, we will not make money on it so that's a, a small example that where you have a political 
politicians uh, and the system uh, that mistreat small farmers, mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, I mean, we could have, uh, after some years, maybe there would be more people wanting our potatoes and then we will make a bigger land for the potatoes and all, but now we can't even start with the potatoes because we uh, in so then you, you can see your production uh, is too um too small, small. yes yeah. okay. and, and yeah. so that is only one example but yeah. you have a uh, lot of them so yeah uh, and i think also in the uh, uh, the diary for example mm -hmm. you you have a uh, uh, now it's, uh, it has become better actually, but yeah. uh, there are uh, the, the, it has been mu very much rules uh, and laws uh, uh, designed for big companies, and uh, but uh, now we have seen a very uh, good uh, thing with this El Drimner and so on, and so it's a very positive development in in Sweden now. But I think it needed in many different, because uh, different spaces. Because I think there are a lot of people want to buy potatoes, for example, for a small uh, grower. But then uh, you will stop the small growers with this law. So. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Like here in the forest outside the mill, you have reindeers. If the reindeer senses a predator coming towards him, he will try to find shelter. He will run faster. He will use up his fat reserve to run, to run faster. We are probably the only animal that we know the danger is coming. Climate change, genetic bottlenecks. And we don't do nothing about it. We talk, we fly people around, big conferences, small conferences, talk, talk, talk. Television is going to play the pop idol tonight out there. So all this problematic is not really making the news yet the way it should. And I what think for, be the first and for me is a paradigm shift, yeah. this anthropocentric mentality where we think we are the species on top of the pyramid mm -hmm. has to change because we are actually one of the most stupid species that exists. And in the future, it will be a new discipline. It will not be anthropology. It will probably be stupidology. Maybe I am one of the biggest stupidologists of the future. I don't know. But you know, these things have to change. It has to change. Like here, we are talking about the gift economy. There are communities nowadays in Sweden and in Europe that are talking in the gift economy. Why don't they talk in the parliaments about the gift economy? Since the society, or at least a part of it, is talking about, you know what, because it's about gifting, it's not about making money. And I have nothing against money, but we have to change. We have to put more values into the game. We need to improve the menu somehow, to improve the recipe, to improve the ingredients, and also work with clear mind of what is at stake. It's very easy to trap Christianity, Muslim, uh, socialist, capitalist, up, down. All these create dualisms and conflicts that, in my opinion, compared to this huge challenge that we have to overcome as a species for our survival, are peanuts. And I really agree. I, I, mean, I, I mean, we were two days on this conference between the arts and the science. I think, like, I don't know if this process has been going for a long time, but it's certainly something that we have to further, like this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary dialogue, because it's just make us open up and to deep brand less monoculture. Huh? It's monoculture of the mind again, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. and at least we have to start by the monoculture of non-thinking, mm. then the next step is the monoculture of thinking, and then at some point we will have a diversity. And this goes back to what I say, we are afraid of diversity. We should not be afraid of diversity, for it is like our very base of our existence, you know. And this we only can have if we, die, if we, produce, if we consume 50 varieties of beans, not only what is frozen on a bag in a supermarket uh, shop. And if you understand, and it's communicated in a transparent way, that you have benefit by direct and indirect benefit by consuming more diversity, people will follow it. We don't necessarily, and I think this is a big achievement of the European family. And I was saying that when like, there were voices saying that Greece should be out of the European Union, and I was invited in the European Parliament and say, look, don't listen to our idiot politicians. 
What we are doing in the society there is good homework for Europe. And this is what I'm hoping to transfer here. Like, you don't have to be with the back in the wall in order to see more. Nowadays, it is your choice if you do it. Because the solution is right in front of you. Of course, it's not something that your TV will tell you. But internet communities, food communities, and the food movement has been an amazing tool to communicate those ideas. And to tell you, in the last years, the food movement has matured a lot. It's not only like going out with a knife towards the big, the mainstream, the, the centralized. I can tell you, people are listening, and like, it is maybe this pool of people that are more conscious and aware, uh, aware that science also needs to embrace. Not in a patronizing manner, but in a manner of explaining transparently what is at stake. And I'm hoping, and that's why we are sitting on this table together. And yesterday, I mean, this is being an amazing week. What is happening in Umeo this, these weeks with the topic of food is really world class. It's a cutting edge. It's cutting edge. I'm just hoping that this legacy will continue because Westerbotten has a very, he has an amazing food culture. Not only the cheeses, not only the Sami culture, a little bit northern. I, I mean, know, yes. it's a very compact community. People know each other. It's a big village in Mali. Then you have a big percentage of people that are educated. You have a university community. You are sitting here on a golden nugget where you can really create a, 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 a an example. You can create a prototype for people like me to show around, you know, I can go to Greece and say, look guys, we have, we have, these guys up there have 10% of biodiversity than we have, but look what they do. And this is like... But just, do you say you have 10% of biodiversity? I mean, Greece has like, yeah. the rest of Europe has 10% of Greek biodiversity. It has been a cockpit of evolution mm -hmm. since ever. Yeah. We just don't see what resource we have there. We are so spoiled, actually. Last year I was in Yerna, there was an amazing chef that told me, look, here the land gives us only two months a year. That's why we have to think, we have to preserve our food, we have to pickle, to salt, to smoke. And I say, ah oh, yeah, in Greece we have food production all over the world, all over the year. That's why we don't really care about it. We are spoiled, we don't think. We are, we are dancing to tapi, I don't know. And <laughs> this is a bad stereotype, by the way. We are not like black and white, 50 year old fit, track and fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do not disagree at all. I do absolutely not disagree with you. You have quite some points in what you say, so so please do not think that. Uh, just just one comment from a Dane to a fellow Swede. You are marvelously old-fashioned with your food. Thank you for that. That's why you have these. Strange cheeses, they're a bit too hard for my cotton thing, but that's it. Uh, we have lost all that in Denmark because we have an industrialized agriculture. So new Nordic food in Denmark means reinvented Nordic food. You have the roots. You can use it for your exports. So just keep on working, I think, in the right direction. So that's, that's one thing. Then concerning this, you said with the diversity, it's true. But please remember, the diversity of Greece belongs to the origin, the, the, what we call the Vavilov regions. These are the regions where crop plants have their origin. So that's why you have the crop wild relatives. So there's a lot of species taken into culture thousands of years ago, also taken into cotton weeds. Most of our food crops are imported. They came with agriculture 6,000 years ago. The only way, the, the only place we can compare here is grass and forage crops, where we have we are in the sense of diversity. So, so there's a difference. Um, just, just this one. Yeah, just once, and then I'll the discussion is meeting an amazing and uh, passionate flow. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know, don't waste any money, time, and energy in those soul alone plastic meals of the fast food. It's really the, the mother of the problem. Here you have a community. If you are bored to cook, take each other email, write to Suji in the Facebook group of Umeo's Cafe and she will connect you. This is the whole idea to start, I mean, to re-transform and rediscover the time and space of food. Food has always been an element of unity and we need this unity, especially in Europe. You know what's happened in the last year? In Greece we have fascism. We were the only country in the EU that we resisted fascism, like, 70 years ago, and now some people in the 21st century rediscovered it. What the hell? 
And I think food and land is something that can unite people and like can unite Europe in this time of crisis. And I think to rediscover the time and space of food is imperative. People have been passing outside this cafe and say, I could never imagine I could have a meal out in the street with my neighbor or someone I don't know. At the end, we are the same species. We are the same. We are, I mean, we are a monoculture after all, in a sense. <laughs> we have a lot of intraspecific inter diversity, of course. But like, first of all, maybe we need to focus more into taking care of our own sort, you know, of our own species. I, I, I really support that, you know. We need to love our species. <laughs> we need to love ourselves, you know, so if we are to love other species in the world. And I'm talking in a, a con we are organizing a Congress for Technologies and Innovation in Democracy, for Democracy. And there I'm, I'm invited to make a small theatrical called The New Political System Should Be Diverse in Democracy. Like, we still have elections, and every species has a vote. So imagine the process we need to do in order to find a single human that will represent us with our single vote. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I have to round up now a bit. Uh, first of all, I think uh, you said we should take care of our own species. We, all of you, is living in the countryside. It's not living here in Umea, but on the land. I know you are. But can you raise your hand? Oh, more people in the panel than in the public. That's interesting. Uh, then another thing is, of course, we go to the to the uh, dessert. But I also want to come back to Susan because um, in her books I found a very interesting thing. I grew up on the countryside. Now I live in the city. I can ask you, who grew up in the countryside of the? Look, that's already more mixed. Um, and that was a very interesting thing because I think when we take care about our own spaces, like Pavlo said, um, we also need to be happy. And see, uh, Susan, in her book, I found something that she said, people that move from the rural to the city, oh, no, I have to say that, people that move from um, the city to the rural are, in a way, equal happy with their uh, surrounding life. But people that go from the rural to the city are less, especially the people that migrated from, are always are in doubt if they should go back. And I recognize that very much. And it's of course not everybody, but the amount was bigger than uh, and the other. So maybe you can round up a bit, uh, Susan, and say something about life in the countryside. Because when we have to grow and go for more diversity, we also need more people attached to the rural and to the countryside. Can you say something about the, or, or was it something I found out of a book you do not have in your head? I found it was quite interesting because I thought, yeah, that's true. All my friends that grew up in the rural always talk about going back. And people that I meet somewhere else or live, uh, that they, they never have these talks, you know. Or people that grow up in cities, live in cities also, I do not have these talks with. But uh, maybe uh, just otherwise say hello to all. <laughs> then we go to the lesson. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to keep you long from your dessert. Um, I was thinking about um, the way that people, there is many, there's lots of research about people moving to the countryside or people moving to the cities and from the countryside and what that, that, actually, that actual migration does to people and their sense of belonging. Um, I know I quoted some, some research in, in that uh, book about um, how urban people and rural people, or people with rural origins compared to people with urban origi origins sort of relate to, to things that are particularly rural, for example wolves or, or other predators and, and, and how that kind of, of attachment or you actual, where you come from actually has some um, bearing on that. But that that's not the main thing. The kind of interesting thing that I think has happened in the last few years is that people seem to have, even though people live in the cities, they seem to have gotten a more of an attachment to things that are rural. They may not want to move to the countryside, but they make their sourdough bread, they do some uh, gardening in the city, they like to wear uh, Wellingtons and barber jackets and they sort of embrace 
sort of ruralness, but staying in the urban. They go for visits in the countryside, love the farmer's market, they want to visit farms. But <laughs> um, there's this trend, and, and the interesting thing for me to think about, or something that I also, I think for everybody to think about, how can we use that trend for people actually taking the leap and moving into the countryside again and become producers and not just consumers of, 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 of the rural. And, and I've done quite a lot of research in, in the UK and also lived in the UK and that's quite interesting because in the, con in, in the UK the countryside is the cool place to live. But they don't move to the countryside to actually be farmers, they move to the countryside because it's expensive, it's got a nice view, it's less crowded and yeah, you know, the rest of it. So they're looking for some kind of a deal, and this deal does not necessarily involve anything to do with agriculture. Um, so I, I think we have quite a lot of challenges in, in, in the future for, for sort of making the countryside actually cool to live in, and actually live in the countryside and not just visit the countryside or, or, or embrace ruralness. Um, yeah, I, I want to round up, but then you have your last sentence now. Yeah. And I think then we are back to the diversity. In fact, I moved from a town to uh, from Stockholm to the countryside, and it was like uh, moving uh, 30 years back in time, <laughs> actually. Uh, and I think still, even if I'm living uh, in the countryside now for a half light a lifetime, still I have problems with this. Um, I mean, it can be so uh, conforming in the countryside. So I think it's a, it, in fact, it's a, a mentality uh, problem too here. In, I mean, it's not just moving out. You have some kind of mentality when you are growing up in a, in a big city, and uh, there are another mentality more uh, formed uh, in. Uh, well, the local uh, civil uh, society, the, it depends very much on how, how, which people are you connected with in relationships and uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, and so on. And when you are new in such a culture, you will always be outside for generations. So I think it's, uh, it's not only about the the uh, farming itself is also about how can we how can we uh, handle this clash of culture being moved from. Okay, I think there's still a lot to say and a lot to talk, but I think uh, here are a lot of places. Come sit here and uh, take your uh, dessert and uh, just uh, talk on the table. Uh, mix up, I would say, and uh, learn Swedish and English and everything. Uh, thank you for your attention, and um, maybe Sushi want to explain what we have as a dessert, or for the panel. Yeah. Glass Bonden uh, in Venice, where you're from. Uh, yeah, and the, the ice cream is called K208 or something. <laughs> but um, I mean, it has milk in it, so if you're vegan, sorry. <laughs> no, but I also have you here because I want to have a huge applause for Sushi. Because she did it all. So Thank you.